Welcome, A Matter of Life. And today I have a wonderful show in store for all of you. We're having to start off with our first three guests. Um, this is little baby Sylvia and her twin sister Haley. Her mom, their mom, Nicole. And um, we also have a beautiful lineup today with two uh, physicians. One is Dr. Grant Clark and the other, Dr. Frank Schell. So we're gonna have a beautiful show today. Um, and it's, it's just gonna resolve around a, a, a certain topic. And, but we're gonna start off with the story of these two beautiful twins and their mom. Um, Nicole, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being on the show. And thank I can't imagine what it was like trying to get these two little girls ready for their debut to TV. Yay. Oh, now don't spit up on the show. My goodness. <laughs> They're beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'd like you to tell our audience um, about your pregnancy and, you know, how it started and, and some of the complications you ran into. And But obviously we're seeing, um, we're holding the results of, of your determination and your faith. Um. I found out that um, I was pregnant after my fiance was deployed for over a year. Um, he came home a couple days before Christmas and I found out around the beginning of February that uh -huh. I was pregnant. I was seven weeks along and um, the doctor was getting closer to the screen as he was doing the ultrasound and it was kind of worrying me. Um, and he looked at me and said, I think we may have two. And I was completely shocked. Um, Twins do run in my family, but I I never really yeah. thought it would happen. And, and your fiance is overseas. At he um, he was actually home at that time. He had came home, oh, but okay. he was uh, living in North Carolina. Okay. And, and he's from here, so he was still pretty far away. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was I was a little shocked, and two. really nervous. <laughs> And uh, he confirmed that there was two. Um, at the time, we didn't know what kind of twins they would be, whether they would be identical or fraternal. Um, that's determined later on when they can see the membrane. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, it was confirmed that they were identical twins two weeks later. And um, I was warned that I would have to start seeing a specialist as well as him. So I started going to a specialist and with the specialist, they told me that there was a possibility of something called twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Twin Which, to twin transfusion syndrome. Yeah. Okay. And it only happens with identical twins. Mm -hmm. But about 75% of the identical twins will develop twin to twin transfusion syndrome during the pregnancy. Um, mm. It usually starts around 16 weeks. And um, what happens is they share a placenta between the two babies, but they have right. their own separate sacs. So inside that placenta, their um, blood vessels will connect with each other. So instead of oh. sharing their blood with me, they share it with each other. Oh, okay. And with uh, the twin to twin transfusion syndrome, one baby is called the donor baby and one is the recipient. And the donor gives all of the blood to the recipient baby. And it starts shutting down vital organs in the donor baby in order to try and get the brain and the heart all of the blood that it needs. And the recipient usually ends up um, going into heart failure because of an overload of blood. Okay. And wow. Sylvia, this must have been such a terrifying, just to hear that. It was. As um, a young The doctors were, were very girl. explanatory, which was somewhat helpful and terrifying at the same time. Sure. <laughs> terrifying. But I'm sure it was. Sylvia was my, was I'm my gonna donor. I'm going to guess that this little teeny tiny one yeah, she was the donor. She was the donor. Yeah. Um, she, um, by the time I had found out that I was in twin to twin transfusion syndrome, she was what they considered a stuck baby, where there's no amniotic fluid around them in the sac. Um, uh -huh. She had shut down her bladder function, so she wasn't urinating. Mm -hmm. um, and she wasn't taking in fluid to urinate because right. she didn't have any. Kind and, of a dry um, sac. Yeah, yeah, and Haley had an overload of fluid. So I found out at 16 weeks that I had entered twin to twin transfusion syndrome and started going for weekly visits. And by 19 weeks, um, they had diagnosed <coughs> me as stage one. Oh, God bless <coughs> you. God bless you again and again. <coughs> oh. <coughs> um, there's four You're stages welcome, to honey. it. 
Um, oh, she talks. Stage one, there's not very much that they can do for it. Um, stage two, they start to, and stage three is when they have certain treatment options for you. Um, the can one I ask you, was, was abortion one of the options that was given to you? It was. The, um, the doctor who went over some treatment options with me said that I could um, treat them with an amniocentesis, which would draw fluid from Haley. Um, it really wouldn't solve anything because um, their vessels would still be connected. They would still transfer back and forth. And um, the other option was a laser treatment that I would have to go to a facility either in Maryland or in uh, Philadelphia. Okay. And the last treatment option he said was, and there's always um, the option of terminating the pregnancy. We are so grateful, Nicole, that you made the decision not to terminate these beautiful little girls. Um, and obviously God blessed you. Isn't that right? <laughs> yes, Sylvia said. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're gonna break now for a minute and then we'll be back um, to chat more with Sylvia and Haley and Mom Nicole. Thank you so much. Welcome back to my show, to Matter of Life. We're here with our guest today. This is little Sylvia. This is Haley. And this is their mom, Nicole. And um, Nicole is here to tell the story of the twins and the difficulties she faced in, in um, meeting this pregnancy. And um, obviously, we're holding these beautiful twins today to say, you know, thank you, God, that you chose the right decision. Um, when I had the twin to twin transfusion syndrome, they had sent me to Maryland to have a laser procedure. Um, the laser procedure was to divide the vessels between them so that they both had a chance at survival. However, when they did the ultrasound at the University of Maryland Hospital, the doctor gave me a 60% chance of being able to save Sylvia and a 0% chance of being able to save Haley. So I was... Can I... The doctor gave you a 60% mm -hmm. chance... To save Sylvia. Saving Sylvia and... A 0% chance to save Haley. Oh. He, um, he... God is really the ultimate didn't, physician, isn't he? Yeah, he really didn't think she would make it. Um, she had developed some problems with her heart and she ended up having a heart attack inside the womb. Um, is so that you because can, of the fluid overload? Yeah. Uh, it's generally what happens. They either go into heart failure or they have a heart attack and then go into heart failure. Um, on the ultrasound, she did lack um, part of the muscle for her heart, but she was able to regenerate it, and she's okay now. She has a little wow. bit of a heart murmur, but that's it. Yeah. Um, so I had everybody at my church praying for them, at my mother's church praying for them. I prayed a lot during the pregnancy, and... Um, what happens is 24 hours after the procedure, they, um, they do an ultrasound to check for two heartbeats. And um, it was the longest 24 hours of my oh. life. <laughs> and sure enough, the next, the next morning we had two heartbeats and then we had two heartbeats again the next day. Oh. So everything, everything with the surgery turned out the way it was yes. supposed to. Yes. And I'm very grateful because the surgeon was able to save both of them. Isn't it amazing when we use technology to save? And do we have a little? Okay. Do you want to? There. Oh, that was a beautiful song, and I'm sure our audience just loved that song. Um, you know, it's, it is amazing to me, though, when we see what technology, when we use it correctly, you know, what it is capable of. Yeah. And praise God, you know, that you had the faith and the courage and the power of prayer yeah. to rely on God to be the ultimate physician. You know, of course, we thank God for technology and gifted physicians who use their talents. But we thank God for moms that listen to their hearts and love their babies more than themselves and are willing to put their odds on the Lord. 
I, I had no choice because he was the only way that they were going to get through everything they got through. And yeah. at the end of the pregnancy, um, I did deliver early at 34 weeks, um, and they were in the NICU for two weeks after their birth, which was another prayer session to try and get through that. Yeah, um, and just seeing them in that neonatal intensive care is difficult, isn't it? All of it was difficult. Yeah. The, the whole pregnancy sure. was difficult. It was um, sure. trials the whole entire way. Even at delivery, I had developed toxemia and had to deliver them early. And uh, the physician that uh, delivered them said that he's never seen twins make it that far with the twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being a guest, for sharing your story, and for allowing your girls to debut on TV <laughs> today. They thank were, you for They were us. beautiful, and, and you're just so beautiful. Thank you're, you. You radiate your faith, and, and you hold the gift of your faith in I your do. hands. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will be back shortly with our next guest. Um, one of our physicians and and we're going to tie in the stories of ultrasound and decision making as we proceed with the show today thank you so much do you want to sing a little ladies and gentlemen welcome back to a matter of life for this segment, I am joined with my guest, Dr. Frank Schell. Doctor is a longtime friend of mine. He serves on Pennsylvania's Northeast Regional Board of Directors as their president for a long time. <laughs> Dr. Schell, welcome to the show. Um, one of the things that I wanted Doctor to talk about today was ultrasound. How ultrasound in the hands of the right person is just so significant in in helping us diagnose and treat uh, intrauterine and we also see it in the hands of the wrong person and the damage it can do. So doctor, talk to us about ultrasound. Ultrasound is a fascinating technique originally developed uh, in two-dimensional which was very difficult for people to interpret. If I showed you a two-dimensional ultrasound you'd scratch your head and say I don't know what I'm looking at and for the most part, I didn't know what I was looking at very much. Uh, the ultrasound but we were all so proud of that first picture of the baby, <laughs> even though, you know, which is the top and which is yeah. the bottom. <laughs> so now the ultrasound has gotten much better. The pictures yeah. are much clearer, but they still rely a great deal on the doctor and on the technician for both uh, appropriate images and interpretation of it. Uh, so there are certain things, if you have those wonderful, what they call four-dimensional ultrasound pictures of your baby, now you can look and you can see the face, and, and boy, that's wonderful. Um, but you can see all types of things on that that are medically important. So uh, you can find things like spina bifida. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find uh, kidney problems. You can find lots of things that can actually be fixed before the baby is born. And in many cases, there is now intrauterine surgery being done, which will save the baby's life, let them come to a normal delivery and have a normal and full life afterwards, when 20 and 30 years ago, those children never would have survived to birth. So right. ultrasound can be an absolutely wonderful tool in the hands of the right people. Uh, on the other hand, it's like a scalpel. You put it in the hands of a surgeon who's committed to preserving life and health, and it's a great tool. And if you give it to someone who's committed to the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, not saving life, and a scalpel itself is a, it turns into a weapon instead of right. a tool. An ultrasound in the hands of the wrong people can be just as bad. They can use it as a weapon by simply not showing you what's there. They can misinterpret. Uh, you know, we know that Planned Parenthood is an organization that's full of lies from top to bottom. Uh, and I can say that truthfully because 35 years ago, I worked at Planned Parenthood as part of my training for a couple of months. Uh, and in that short exposure, I just learned it was an organization that you couldn't trust. Right. So you give uh, this organization a tool to decide how far along the pregnancy is. They can decide if they want to do an abortion. Uh, and guy wants money, so if he's supposed to stop at 20 weeks and it looks like 22 weeks, he just writes it as 20 weeks right. and does an abortion. Right. Uh, and and there's nobody that, checking. And there's, hear that story mm, so often. It's right. far uh, beyond what the mother thought it was when she went in for that abortion. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know what, the other thing that's interesting is recently there's been this big fuss, uh, uh, some 
states that tried to mandate that women all have an, uh, an ultrasound prior to an abortion be shown the ultrasound, and all of a sudden it's a yeah, terrible imposition on the women when it turns out that Planned Parenthood and a lot of other abortionists have been doing ultrasounds on most of their patients most of the time for a long time, but all of a sudden it's bad right. because why? Because the law says the ultrasound must be shown to the woman. And the abortion industry knows that when women see the ultrasound of their baby and see the beating heart and see the same things that the abortionist sees, a lot of them change their minds. Right. They see a baby. Right. They don't see a problem. They understand that there is a life inside them and that life is precious. And seeing a face on their child makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. So, And why wouldn't we all advocate for that to happen since somewhere down the line, the, the depression that can set in. We know all the side effects of an abortion. Why not give her the opportunity to know full well what she is about to do? Well, it makes perfect sense from our side of the fence, but if you're the abortionist, it's really gonna cut into your business. So uh, they have no interest in the health of the woman and obviously none in the health of the child. Their interest is in their business, which is what it is, it's a business. And if they need deceptive practices to market it, they have deceptive practices. We've mm -hmm. heard over the years more than enough testimony from the people from inside Planned Parenthood and other abortion clinics that lying is a routine daily thing. Yes. They are trained, the, the counselors are trained not to let women know what's in their best interest, not to discuss whether having a baby and giving up for adoption, keeping it, what are the other options, what sources of help are available. They don't know that. The counselors are trained to convince a woman that abortion is in her best interest. They're there to make the biggest sell. Yes, and the counselors right. frequently get a bonus every time they persuade someone to have an abortion. Yeah. Well, and that is the, that's what we're here to say, that ultrasound can, can be so significant, so important, as we learned from our first guest today, or in the hands of the wrong person, um, you know, how dangerous it can become. Dr. Shell, thank you for being here with us and, and sharing your knowledge. And um, hopefully we will we will encourage women to seek that ultrasound as part of uh, going for prenatal care and certainly before you would ever make a decision to abort. Thank you. We'll have more with Dr. Frank Shell when we return. Welcome back to A Matter of Life. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with my guest, Dr. Frank Schell, and our topic has been ultrasound. And you know, one thing that I was mentioning is that sometimes a woman gets that result of her ultrasound, and it may be such a terrifying event as, we, as the doctor will say, and now we're going to have you see our genetic counselor to see what you would like to do about this pregnancy. They don't generally say what you want to do or what we can do for your baby. So, um, Dr. Shell, can you speak to that, to uh, you know, what these ultrasound results can be and how it can affect uh, a woman in her decision making? In the old days, a woman would deliver a baby with no ultrasound and you would have- Very old days, not yes. so old, were they? <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, they'd hand yeah. you your baby and you would bond with your baby. And if the baby had a problem, you'd bond anyway, mm -hmm. okay? Right. That's how Mother Nature and the Lord intended all this. And nowadays we have ultrasound, which in some cases uh, can be life-saving for the baby. It, it's not common, but it does happen that a problem is discovered that can be fixed and save the baby's life so the baby can be born. But it's far more common that they will tell you they've discovered a problem on the ultrasound. And as we discussed in the prior segment, ultrasounds are not an exact science. And many times they'll see something on the ultrasound or think they see something on the ultrasound and be wrong. We see case after case where women were told that their baby was going to have this problem and have that problem right. and that they should definitely have an abortion because the ultrasound shows something. The woman decided she was not going to have an abortion and delivered a completely normal child. That's one end of the fence. The other, the other side of the spectrum is that a child with a defect is still a child. And if you talk to the parents who have children with disabilities, uh, physical or mental, they still love their children. It doesn't right. make them less of a child. 
And in many instances, it actually makes for a better family life. Now that sounds strange, and why would I say that? And the answer is, I've taken care of many people who have children with Down syndrome, and I've taken care of the children. And my experience with Down syndrome children is not that they're a burden on a family, they are a blessing. They and, are loving. And they, yes, oh. a, they, a Down syndrome child loves everybody they meet. You have to do something bad to them for them to not love you. It's not that you right. have to earn their love, they just give it. That's easily seen because there's actually waiting lists for families who want to adopt Down syndrome babies. Is that right? They already have a Down syndrome baby and they want more because they just bring so much love and happiness into the family that they would like to have more children yes. with exactly the same what society calls a problem. And those families understand that it's a difference, but it's not a problem. Yeah. And, and you know, I often think that, you know, aren't we challenged as, as a society, um, for those of us who are Christian, aren't we challenged to embrace, uh, you know, they're not less than we are, they're just different. They have challenges that maybe I don't have, but they have every right to life. And, and God didn't make any mistakes, you know, He gives us he gives us those who, who might bring out a compassionate and loving side in us. And, and they make us better because we love them. And um, yeah, I think that women need to be offered support and good answers that will help their children and help them um, to, to believe in, and have confidence in their courage and strength as a mother and not give the answer to kill your child because it will come back to haunt them, you know? Yeah, and just to pick up on something you said before, it's not just that they're not less than they are, than we are. I frequently think that Down syndrome children are more than we are. They love better than we do. They have a beautiful spirit. They do. Yes. They do, yeah. and I think they set an example for society by themselves. Yeah. They do, they do. They, they have a gentleness, uh, so often a gentleness and, and a serenity that we don't. Thank you so much for being my guest today on A Matter of Life. I have always valued your opinion and your insights in, into life matters. And so thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. We will return um, in a few minutes after we break for this commercial. Welcome back, it's a matter of life, and I'm here, I'm joined with my guest, Dr. Grant Clark. And Doctor has a moving story to share with all of us. He is a physician, and he's gonna tell us a bit about the journey his life took. I've wanted to be a doctor since I was a kid, and go into mission field. Um, but I found out that the mission field somewhat came to me. And so I was rather surprised at that. Uh, I graduated from the University of California mm -hmm. in San Francisco with my medical doctor degree and went into practice first in Los Angeles for three years, then seven years, six years in Northern California where this story mostly takes place. Then I moved to a little place called Benton, Pennsylvania, and came out on a sabbatical. And 27 years later, I was still there. And then when my first wife died, then I moved back to Oregon, where I'm oh. from. Well, you're well-traveled. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and also uh, in the latter part of my practice in, in uh, Pennsylvania, I was able to go on short-term mission trips around the whole world, essentially, bringing teams in to remote areas and practicing medicine. Is this like a Christian-based mission or? Oh, yes. Well, okay. Oh, yes. And yes, I preach at times, but uh, okay. to the patients, no. Um, the reason for being here, as far as I can tell, is that the episode that happened in Northern California was a highlight in my life and it was also the low point in my life. And I'd like to share some of that yeah, with you. Yeah, please tell us right. about it. 
I was only in practice for uh, f about four years when abortions in California became legal and uh, were presented as the only way to go. Uh, this, this is an answer to a problem of overpopulation. It's an answer to uh, people's wishes and dreams that you know, they could get rid of things in their life. Including and, babies. Including babies. Mm -hmm. And someone had to do the getting rid of. Um, I attended a meeting f sponsored by Planned Parenthood in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And they presented like it was just a wonderful thing to do. And I knew that my patients in the county hospital in Northern California, the patients did not get med good medical care. And so I went at it with a missionary heart of these people shall receive good medical care. I'll do my best to do it. And so abortions came into my life or I came into their life. I'm not sure so, which. So in your mind, you were able to, uh, you're this idealistic physician and in your mind, you're able to think of killing babies as part of a, a health care, is that health care? In your, no, it's in your not health care. But I, at that time, I'm just trying to think, how would you Oh, it started easily. That? It started very easily of these aren't babies. Uh -huh. It's sort of like the Jewish people aren't people type thing. Right. And then what Hitler did to them was essentially right. what I did. Uh, I was trying to help. I was going at it with a fervor of help, that these people needed help, and I could offer them that help. Wow. I tried to talk them into uh, to adoptions, because I myself had adopted a child that I delivered, and uh, also many other children who were adopted in our family. So killing babies, the, those terms weren't Aren't it, didn't come to my mind right. that they weren't babies yet. One day they would be, but n then they were not. And that's what essentially led to the mm -hmm. rescue from this hole that had gotten into. So it was the process of when does a baby become a baby? Uh, at which point in their development are they a child and before that they weren't? And once that was settled, then all the rest of them, you know, all things were settled too. That when a baby becomes a baby, according to various religions, one is conception, some even before then. And with me is, well, I knew it was before they were born. And I knew it was before, you know, months where they were viable if they were born, they could still live and their right. body would function. Uh, it was before then, but exactly when. And turns out the Catholics were right. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Thank the, you. <laughs> it, starts, it starts at conception. It's right. when the DNA is complete and unique and never to be repeated again, I guess. Uh, and the, don't you think, though, that that's, I mean, maybe the Catholics advocated or your fundamentalist Christians advocated for that philosophy, but science tells us that's a unique human being yes. at the moment of conception. That's true, but it needs a body at that point. It's not just a group of little cells. Uh -huh. But as the baby develops inside the mother's womb, uh, when does it become a baby? And the answer for me was in Jeremiah, the first chapter, where it says, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew, I knew you. you. It was a you, it wasn't a it, it wasn't a thing, it wasn't a group of cells, it wasn't DNA, it was you. God knew me yes. before I was in my mother's womb. Well, there is a, Conception takes place clear out in the fallopian tube in the oviduct. And 
then the baby moves down the tube and implants in the uterus. So before I knew you, or before you were in your mother's womb, I know you. That has to be at conception. Yes. It has to be then at that moment. God said, there you are. And I've mm -hmm. set you in, in place. I know what you're going to do with your life. I know what my plan is for you, yeah. even right then at birth. So that immediately when that sunk in to me, then the whole idea of, oh my Lord, I've been killing people, real people, little people, but real people. And that just really flooded me with remorse, regret, and never again. Wow. It was aided. What was, the late, what was the latest term, baby, that you ever terminated? Mm. That was one of the reasons why I quit doing them, too. Uh, the mother said it was six months along. This was a, the type where you inject saline or salt saline. solution into mm -hmm. the uterus, and the baby then is aborted. And the mother said it was six months. I couldn't really tell on examination, and we did not have uh, the techniques that we have nowadays, uh, ultrasound and so on. We didn't have that back, back in the 70s, early 70s. The baby was born alive, burnt, blind, distorted, and horrible. And what, what do you do at that point? I could transfer the little baby down into San Francisco for care, six hours away. It wouldn't live six hours. Or I could try to, you know, do something. Were you aborting these babies in a hospital or yes. a clinic? Hospital. In a hospital. Mm -hmm. A county hospital. At any rate, when the baby did die within a few hours, and uh, sent the mother home, and the, the baby to the morgue or to the laboratory. Then there were a couple other factors besides that horrible thing. I said, no more, none of that. Anything over three months of age, no, no way am I going to abort it. Then the clientele began to change too. I was working at the county hospital and people tend to be demanding, uh -huh. uh, maybe in a different way than any other hospital. But some of the demands were getting ridiculous. And uh, it's when I said, this is selfishness. This is about selfishness and fear. And why should I be motivated by selfishness and fear? I didn't make a penny off of it. I was working on a salary. I got zero money from doing abortions. And I did hundreds of them. And so it wasn't you money for me. You did hundreds of abortions. Yes. Wow. And to realize that it's a human life. You were a healer. You were destined by God to be the physician and healer. It hurt. It hurt. Still hurts. Hasn't quit hurting. Um, at any rate, the lady that really brought it to an edge and stopped all abortions that I was doing, she was pregnant and came in for a DNC and I did it and all we got back was a dead placental tissue. So I told her, well, you've had a, a miscarriage already and all we did is clean out the uterus. Some months later, she delivered a healthy child. How could that be? Two uteruses is the only thing I can think of. And because uh, I cleaned out one and I know. Oh. And sent yeah. the material to the lab and they said, yeah, you did it. She sued me after uh, she gave the baby up for adoption and sued me for uh, all the pain and anguish she had to go through in having this baby that she didn't want to have. Your abortion failed, she had a baby. She had a baby. And that a made live, you a healthy failure. one, 
and she and it was healthy and she adopted it out and then she sued me for 18 years of child care costs for this baby that she adopted out and I'm beginning to think oh ooh, this lady is not really with us <laughs> at any rate oh. Well, wow. how, how can you sue for baby care when you've adopted out the baby? Yeah. And so I... Uh, Dr. Well, Clark, we're going to break for a brief message <laughs> and come back <laughs> to this. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. And I, I think we need to hear a little bit more of Dr.'s story. So when we return, um, thank you so much. <laughs> Welcome back at Matter of Life. I'm here with my guest today, Dr. Grant Clark. And Doctor has been talking about his experience, um, his journey, a, a young boy who wanted to become a, a medical doctor and very idealistic. He talked about missionary work as a, as a doctor. Somehow through Planned Parenthood and, and through his idealism, he is falsely led down this journey and gets into the abortion industry. Um, <clears throat> doctor, please tell us more about your story. And, um, well, and I appreciate so much <clears throat> that you've let us see a little bit of the pain that it's caused you, as you recall, that time in your life. And it is painful. Yeah. It's painful to find out you thought you were, I thought I was so right. It was the right thing to do. And I was helping people and found out I was doing something horrible. And how, how do you get out of it? Well, I was abruptly ejected, as it turns out, from the standpoint that when I saw the baby who was born alive and supposed to be dead, like the little John, abortion. Yeah. and the, uh, uh, the change of the attitude of people um, all this going on at the same time of when does a baby become a baby? This meant everything to me. This is important because I was so wrong and there was no way I could go back and make it right. Abortion like murder or is murder there's no way you can go back and bring people back to life again. If, if you've harmed someone and you've fixed what, what went wrong, that's one thing, but I didn't see any way out of this. Can I ask you something? <clears throat> the little baby that you described, a saline baby born alive, you, it ran through your head. I, I can get this baby help if I send him to San Francisco. What did you do? What did the doctor and you do what? I was a coward. I added cowardice to everything else and simply left the baby in bed with the mother and let it die there. Uh, I did not put it on a sinker in some other room. At least I kept it with the mother. And I, I think How did now she that... respond to seeing her baby like that? She was very, very upset. Yeah. She didn't want to talk to me or anyone else at that point. Okay. The second case that I was telling you about, uh, the, I call it the art of selfishness. This mother who had delivered a normal, healthy baby, adopted it out, and then sued me for all these things that would have happened to her if I hadn't even been in the picture. Mm -hmm. I changed nothing. Yeah. And she uh, sued me for lots and lots and lots of money. And the lawyer that I had said, you're approaching it wrong. Let me offer her $2,000 if she'll get out of town. He offered it to her, to her. she took it and left. 
And I left abortions at that point. Said, yeah. it isn't right, it is horribly wrong, and I'm not gonna have anything to do with it from here on. And that's how I went on in medical practice, moved to Pennsylvania, a rural country medicine, which I I can loved. imagine the living with that. I mean, it, you end it, but the memories are there. That child is there, the mother. You suppress it, yeah. saying, let's get on with life. God is the only one who can cleanse me of my sin. Jesus' blood is perfect and I am not, and neither is heaven made up of perfect people. It's made up of overcomers. How do I overcome? By the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of my testimony. Yes. And that's what finally got to me about five years ago, the word of my testimony. I was driving with my wife. My first two wives died. My third wife is still in the audience here this morning. Thank Stay God. Stay healthy. <laughs> <laughs> she looked healthy. Stay healthy, Irene. At any rate, we saw a, a billboard along the road saying, abortion scoreboard, one dead, one wounded. And I thought, no, that's one dead and a whole bunch of people wounded, including right. the mother, including the grandmother, the father of the child, and the doctors, and the, doctors. And the nurses. And They're the nurses and the society at large and families who could have had a little brother or sister that abortion wounds a world. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. This guest is just so interesting. I am so grateful for you being with us, for you sharing your heart and your story with us. And we will be back in just a few minutes. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a very powerful show as we meet Dr. Grant Clark, who has taken us from his journey, young, idealistic kid wanting to be a missionary, medical doctor, how Planned Parenthood becomes involved in his life, how he turns to cowardice, and today we've watched as cowardice becomes courage, and through the grace of the Holy Spirit, he he gives us this powerful testimony, which um, just spoke so much to my heart and I hope to all of you, um, Dr. Grant Clark. Once I decided to stop all abortions, it was a long ways before speaking out against abortions. Most of that time, about 20 years or more, <clears throat> I said nothing about abortions. I moved away from Northern California. And yes, I consistently voted against it. Yes. But as far as speaking out or standing in front of clinics and, and holding signs, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was effective for me. It w I would not have been impressed by it if someone was trying to change my mind with walking around a little sign. Some people are changed, but right. I, I, I didn't think that was Grant Clark. <clears throat> so I said nothing and said nothing, occasionally in a, in a Sunday school class or something like that, when it was appropriate, you know, little pieces. Well, but, you shared that you, didn't, you had not even told your wife. I hadn't about even it. told my wife yeah. about it. And I didn't realize I was really hiding anything we suppress. from it. We suppress. I just yeah. suppressed it. But then the Lord put it in my heart that you've got to take even that part of your life and make it useful to others. And so since that time I have spoken on television and interviews and uh, um, wow. across the whole United States 
uh, the, I think the largest group I ever spoke to is just about a month ago in Indiana. There were 500 people there. Wow. Well, that, that, that didn't overawe me, as a matter of fact, because still it's the word of the testimony that is important, not Grant Clark. Yeah, and so it's all for the greater glory. This, this, right? this is what happened to me. This is how I got into it with religious idealism and suddenly finding that I was doing horrible things in the name of helping. And I, I created more sorrow and more anguish in this world now than, than I probably ever did good. I know that they would have gone somewhere else. They would have found another doctor. They'd found someone else to do it. But I was doing it with a fervor of when I was told uh, this is wrong. I said, no, this is a, not a good choice, but the other choices aren't all that wonderful either. But I didn't realize in suppressing it in myself, I had even failed to to tell my wife about it, yeah. my, my third wife. My first two died. Wow. And uh, so talking with her and encouraged by her, then started looking for places to speak out against abortions. And I've been speaking out abortion against abortions for the last five years. And do you experience a healing in yourself to some extent, as you, as you take the courage to speak out and change lives and hearts. As I said before, it still hurts. It'll always hurt. And I look at the hands of a physician and I always look at the hands of a physician because they're healing hands. And when, when blood is on those hands, bloodshed, um, that's, that's wrong, that's against your oath, that's, that's against those Ten Commandments, the laws of God, you know, but, but you took your hand and you reached it out to God and, and the blood of God cleanses the blood that was shed. It does indeed, but the yeah. second part that goes with it is the word of your testimony. Yes. So when I right. get the chance to give my testimony about what happened to me, I think it helps those, I know it helps those that happened to them too, yes. in some way or another. Either the, just last night when I was telling this story, the f man who was listening about my age said, I got a girl pregnant before I was married, before I knew the Lord, and I paid for her abortion, and it's been hurting ever since. Yeah. <clears throat> So the pain goes on and the desire to reach out and help those who are in pain goes on too, thank God. Yes. And show them, yes. don't be afraid to say that this was a baby. This baby has a name. Give that baby a name. If necessary, make a tombstone and have the yes. baby's name and date of birth and death, or all the same date. Uh, the same usually, That yes. is healing. Yes. It does help yes. uh, talking with others. I think this others. powerful voice is going to speak out to women who have chosen abortion, to women who are faced with the crisis pregnancy and, and beginning to examine their options to realize the pain lingers that God has an answer for you. We need to look to the right people. I hope too that our young medical students going, you know, going into medical practice today with idealism, they're gonna be confronted as part of their obstetrical training, how to abort a baby. You know, have courage, learn from this man's journey, from his pain, from his integrity, and the, the journey he has walked. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being my guest, for being here with us, and for, gi for giving us a message of forgiving. Um, thank you so much.